Welcome everyone to this uh, BlackBerry LinkedIn Live series where we love to discuss threats, applied countermeasures, news, and everything that will be of interest to this uh, awesome community, right? Threat research, uh, cyber defense, and the intelligence community. On this uh, episode, we're going to talk about a new Delphi-based ransomware as a service. Yes, Delphi-based. We're going to talk about more about that called Monster. And uh, I wonder where that name comes from. We're going to discuss this in this. Uh, we're going to demystify that in this uh, um, in this episode. Now, while many threat actors love to fly under the radar, we've also seen that there's a trend for some of these ransomware authors, these uh, groups, to intentionally plan like some like false flags or, or clues in an effort to uh, maybe throw off investigators, right, and even authorities, uh, law enforcement. So is this the monster thing, the work of a copycat threat actor? Is it maybe a growing trend? Do we see a lot of this in the BlackBerry threat research uh, team? That's what we're going to be discussing uh, today in today's panel. So uh, I'm going to ask you to please, I know we have people joining us from all over the world uh, for each of these sessions. So, you know, please say hi, tell us where you're joining us from. And uh, if you have any questions, any comments, feel free to put them on the chat so we can uh, we can have a look at, at that. And while we do that, we're going to introduce our panelists, uh, Claudia and Natasha. Uh, Claudia Preciado is a threat researcher at BlackBerry uh, in our threat research and intelligence team. Thank you, Claudia, for joining us today. Happy to be here. Hi. Excellent. <laughs> And we also have Natasha Rohner. Uh, she's a principal threat research publisher who is uh, essentially in charge of publishing our awesome research and all the articles and uh, all the you know cool blogs that we do. As you can tell, I'm clearly biased. But thanks, Na Natasha, for joining us today. Great to be here. Awesome. I still I see some people. Yes, applied countermeasures. Some folks saying hi. Excellent. Nice to see you all. Well, let's talk about uh, Monster. Uh, we have this report, this blog that we we published, and uh, every every week or every other week we publish this research. Uh, we've been doing this for many years now, right? I can't remember exactly the many. Uh, I, I don't know if Natasha remembers the number of all the blogs that we have published over the over the years. I think it's close yes. to four thousand. Wow, four thousand. Yeah. yeah, since we started the blog, yeah. That's amazing. I like your library, by the way. That's pretty cool too. <laughs> and, and I don't know this. These reports cover, you know, uh, we try to cover whatever is of interest to the to the community. As I said before, it could be uh, known pieces of malware that we see while our instant response team is doing an investigation. And, you know, that's why I, li I love instant response. Something I've been doing for many years myself. Uh, because you you get to see the latest and and the greatest. You're in the trenches and. You see the latest things that the threat actors are, are doing. Sometimes we uncover new threat actors, new campaigns, while we're also looking at existing uh, infections, right? And recently we're looking at Monster, which is, as I said before, a Delphi-based ransomware as a service that was first seen in March 2022. And uh, our incident response team was also working on a case where we, where we saw this one. And when I was, you know, reading the blog and, and looking at the research, it's very intriguing because in, it includes some IOCs uh, that might be, um, um, you know, similar to IOCs from other threat actors. And we're wondering, is this something that maybe uh, they're using to throw off the analysts, law enforcement? Um, it's similar to maybe in the in the TTPs or in the way they're acting to, to Monty. Uh, this was a very successful uh, blog that has had a lot of media coverage over the last uh, few weeks. We had a LinkedIn Live with Dimitri, with Ryan, with Anoush a couple of weeks ago talking about this Monty ransomware, this Monty group uh, that reuses these TTPs of this uh, very well-known Conti uh, threat actor. So I wonder, is this uh, something intentional? Is it that attackers are just lazy? They just want to reuse someone else's code? Uh, Claudia, I know you were one of the authors on this investigation, on this monster write-up. Uh, can you give us a bit of background on uh, what actually made you take a look, a closer look at monster? Yeah. Um, so initially, uh, my colleague and co-author Alex and I were diving into research about Zeppelin uh, following the CISA notice last month. Uh, when we came across an incident that our own IR team had worked on with a lot of similarities to Zeppelin. Um, and when we dug deeper into it, that's when we discovered Monster. Um, so Monster 
like Zeppelin is also Delphi based um, and it does have a lot of similar IOCs because it is ransomware as a service. Um, the threat actors or the authors of this malware um, allow whoever buys it to customize it and customize the extensions and the ransomware note, uh, which is what initially led to some of the confusion because the ransom note that we saw in Monster is identical to ones in Zeppelin. Um, and so the more we dug into it, the more we discovered some of the uniqueness of Monster. Um, it, for example, it has a GUI or a graphical user interface that the threat actor can use to perform a variety of functions. And then that customizable aspect of it also allows whoever is using it to masquerade as other popular malware campaigns. Um, so we've seen some strange extensions um, and, but the default extension is uh, dot monster. Dot monster. So that's where the name comes, yeah. comes from. Now yeah. I, I read about something very interesting about this um, uh, monster as well. And it's the way it was tracking the victims IPs, which is, you know, it's common actually with, with malware infections, but I believe there were some exclusions there or some checks that were, were done. Can you tell us more about that? Yes. Uh, so this is also one of those IOCs that uh, initially confused us uh, because we have seen it in other types of ransomware. Um, but Monster will check for the device's IP address um, and purposely exclude uh, any of the CIS countries. Mm -hmm. So um, those would be the Commonwealth of Independent States. Uh, typically, it's what was once a part of the Soviet Union. Um, so that's what we saw in Monster as well. That's that's very interesting. And, um, um, you know, we, we have uh, Dimitri Restrichev also joining us on the chat. He says, Delphi sounds like uh, some old uh, Trojan bankers from Brazil. Well, maybe now I'm going to identify myself <laughs> as old as well. But I remember Delphi was the first uh, uh, GUI type of uh, programming language that I, I used uh, back in the 90s coming from Turbo, uh, Turbo Pascal. And I, when I saw Delphi, I loved it. I think it was Delphi 3 or Delphi 4. I don't know. And I'm, I'm looking all here. Uh, but this morning, I was looking at you know, how much Delphi-based uh, malware we can see, for example, in Virus Total. Uh, it, do you actually see a lot of, uh, is it very common? You, you come across uh, Delphi? As, uh... It, it's not as common as other languages, but we are seeing a growing trend in uncommon programming languages being used in malware. Um, Delphi is one of them. Um, we've seen some in Rust and Go as well. Um, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, so this morning I was looking at that on, on Vitus Total and I found that, the, not surprisingly, because we have been reporting that in our blogs as well, uh, we see a lot of um, um, downloaders related with, uh, or binaries related with uh, gaming as for, uh, you know, hacks or patches or cracks, uh, you know, uh, cheats for, for gaming specifically that comes with this type of uh, malware, right? And in many cases, as we know, it also drops uh, info stealers. Now, uh, we talk a little bit about what makes Monster unique and specific, but I know Natasha, going back to the to the many reports that we have written over 4,000 <laughs> many years, we have been uh, reporting lately about threat actors using this ransomware as a service threat. It's not something, not something new. Um, and, and we see this growing trend, right? Of, authors creating this ransomware service and then selling these to other bad, bad actors or even bad, other bad actors uh, using leaked source code and, and, and reusing this. Uh, can you tell us about maybe other recent cases where we have been discussing this in our reports? Certainly. Um, let me first talk about Zeppelin. Um, this ransomware as a service is also written in the programming language of Delphi, the same as Monster, and the threat actors who created it also uh, appear to be based out of Russia. Now, Zeppelin is interesting because it's the newest member of the RAS family known as Vega or Vega Locker. Uh, Vega samples first popped up a couple of years ago as part of a malvertising campaign that uh, also targeted Russian speaking users. Now, the Zeppelin variant was visibly distinct. Its binaries are designed to quit running on machines that are based in Russia and some other ex USSR countries. Now, this is similar to Monster, which also quits if it finds out the host machine is located in one of the 12. Commonwealth of Independent States countries, including the Russian Federation. 
This major shift in targeting Russian speaking to Western countries suggests to me that uh, Zeppelin ransomware ended up in the hands of different threat actors, either used by them as a service or redeveloped from bought, stolen or leaked services. Hmm. That, that reminds me a lot of the uh, Monty case that we uh, discussed a couple of weeks ago. If anybody maybe wasn't uh, uh, you know, connected a couple of weeks ago, can you give us like a summary of what this Monty uh, research highlighted? Sure. Uh, Monty ransomware would be another one our team has been digging into lately. Back in July of this year, uh, BlackBerry's security services incident response team, they were engaged to perform a forensic investigation and respond to a ransomware related security incident. The Monty threat actor apparently intruded via an exploitation of the well-known log for shell vulnerability, which we also wrote a blog on back then. Uh, BlackBerry researchers believe that the Monty group purposefully mimicked the better known Conti team's tactics, techniques and procedures, along with many of its tools and also its ransomware encrypted payload. So that's uh, that's a report that, thanks to Tasha, if you haven't had a chance, right, in the audience to, to check it out, please uh, uh, check it out. We also have a LinkedIn Live on, on this a couple of weeks ago with Dimitri, Anush, and, and Ryan. But um, do you think that this is like kind of a, a trend, uh, Claudia? Do you think like, uh, do you see like attackers, you know, getting lazier? Uh, I, I've always said this, by the way, you know, I've always said attackers are lazy. If they can go uh, get away with doing something, you know, that works, it's more simple. It takes less time. Why would you do something very complicated? Like, you know, they're, they're, they're human. Sometimes we forget this. Attackers are humans, just like us. And if I could get away with doing my job in less hours, I can spend the rest of the day, you know, doing something else, I would do it. Uh, is that what you, what you see happening, Claudia? Uh, yeah, I would say ransomware as a service models are becoming increasingly popular. Um, and there are a lot of benefits to it uh, for a threat actor to subscribe to one of these models. Uh, for one, they can attack someone without actually having to create their own ransomware. Um, and if they were to couple that with an initial access broker, then they've eliminated all the difficult parts of orchestrating an attack. Um, but there are some cons to it. Um, if they, once defenders know how to detect these threats, they can mm -hmm hinder an entire ransomware uh, campaign or anyone that's subscribed to it will be affected by it. Um, but yeah, I would say there's been some laziness or it has eliminated some of the most difficult parts. Um, so I would see why it's become more popular. <laughs> I, I like your thinking, Claudia. I, uh, I call this like red blue asymmetry, right? When the attackers, when you can find a something that attackers do, one of their TTPs, that we can we as defenders we can exploit to have an advantage over the adversary so the fact mm -hmm. that they're lazy they're reusing code and it's an opportunity for us to say okay that's what we try to do through our blogs right exposing how how they uh, uh, behave so we can we can uh, exploit that weakness and and use this to our uh, advantage um there's a good question actually from dimitri <laughs> claudia why do you think that uh, they would exclude those IP blocks. We talk about CIS, right? Any mm -hmm. potential attribution? What do you think? Uh, so we have seen this in a lot of ransomware recently. So I wouldn't say it's a clear indicator or like something that we can easily attribute to a certain country or location. Um, but uh, this monster was originally seen as an advertisement on a Russian dark net forum um so could be possible to say it might have originated from somewhere in that region yeah interesting but as we said before right we, we can always yeah. we can always say this with 100 percent confidence yeah in the sense exactly. that we know attackers also planned like false false flags mm -hmm. um that brings another good question like what's the current status of monster is this an active threat right now I think uh, some um, uh, Javier was mentioning that some vendors are blocking these domains uh, with dot monster extension as well is this an active threat uh so that original post that was on the forum was taken down or well the forum was taken down uh and we haven't seen any new advertisements for it um but there's no telling how many people did get their hands on it before the post went down um and we have our researchers have seen uh threat actors using monster as recently as just a couple days ago on the 20th 
Excellent. We have another uh, question that like digging deeper, like is Monster leveraging native Windows 32 APIs for crypto usage? Um, it is actually not. Um, it is using, um, I forget the name. <laughs> It's all right. It's um, all right. We can come back to that. Yes. But, um, <laughs> but it's not using Windows 32 APIs for it. It's not. Right. Right, right. No worries. If you remember it, we can yeah. we can mention it later. Otherwise, yeah. it's also on the it's also on the blog, right? That we're gonna we're mm -hmm. gonna be adding the link the link here. Um, talking about the blog, uh, we always include right counter measures. We always uh, want to make this actionable. So we have some Yara rules, uh, some mitigation tips against well to defend against uh, monster. What what can do the our viewers to protect themselves from these type of threats and um, you know similar ones as we, as we have seen mm -hmm. well um alex did write a very great ur rule so i would say definitely take advantage of those ur rules to detect any activity um on the file system or the memory um and other things would be to stay alert and look for any unusual activity um, in your network with ransomware as always uh, back up your data um, use secure passwords change them frequently um, or you can use the most updated version of our endpoint product to prevent this threat as well absolutely absolutely thank you so yes you know obviously we we, we want to provide uh, coverage to to our customers and typically if you go to the blogs and go to the blackberry thread research you're going to see like even demos of how these uh, uh you know threats uh, can be uh, can be blocked by by our solution but we also like to contribute again to the community with uh content that can be actioned in many different ways yara has a lot of different integrations and you could use this to search yeah for this in in, in memory file system etc that's very nice. Well, you know, thanks a lot for sharing all this detail uh, research. But since I have you here now, and and I would love to learn a bit more about about you. How about we, you know, try to turn the focus a little bit on your personal journey into cybersecurity? Um, I just came from a from a conference where, you know, we had a, a great panel on women in cybersecurity. Uh, you know, I have a, a daughter myself, and uh, we typically talk about this: how we can get like more women inter interested in, in cybersecurity. And what I think that is very interesting about having you both here is that um, many people might be surprised with, with your journeys because it might not be what they think it is, right? Sometimes we always think about, oh, you know, somebody getting a lot into math and then like crazy math and, and doing reverse engineering. And But cybersecurity is, is a very wide field and, and we have a lot of different opportunities and possibilities for somebody to to get into cyber. Um, so maybe starting with uh, you, Claudia, uh, what got you interested in cybersecurity and how did you end up doing what you do today? Mm -hmm. um, I think you made a really good point. Um, sometimes it's not the most straightforward path to cybersecurity. Um, I personally started um, by studying computer science um, and I knew that I didn't want to go down the software engineering path. Um, and so one of my first internships was working with um, an incidents response and vulnerability management team. Um, and that's where I really it opened the door in my eyes to cybersecurity, I would say. Um, and from there, my interest just started growing. There was just so much to cover and to learn. And um, I found myself at BlackBerry and eventually that turned into a full-time role. Um, and so, there's a little bit of pivoting. Uh, now, don't do incidents response. I am working in threat research. Um, and I've been very uh, grateful to work with a lot of wonderful people that have taught me a lot of what I know now and have really supported me in exploring these interests. Um, and so, for example, like diving into this uh, ransomware monster has been so exciting. Um, <clears throat> and I wouldn't. I wouldn't know um, where else I could do this. I feel like awesome. this confirms I'm in the right place. Yeah. Excellent, <laughs> and we we love to have you here with us. <laughs> and and I like I like what you said about you know not having a linear career path. I think that's something um, when when you know some people ask me for for advice like how you know how do you get to do this, and and I would say just like pick something that interests you because there's always the possibility to pivot from there, right? But you want to always keep yourself motivated. And, and you do that by, well, 
taking up challenges and, and, and growing in that way. How about you, Natasha? I, I, I think your background is also like completely <laughs> different, but still, you know, you're part of a threat research team. How, how do you do that? That's right. Well, um, I had a very roundabout journey into cybersecurity. Um, I previously worked for a technology recruiting company where I ran their blog as a managing editor. Uh, I was then hired by a startup company called Silence. Silence, we can see it here. There you go. <laughs> and they wanted me to do the same thing, basically run their blog, you know, work with their founding members. Fast forward six or seven years and Silence was acquired by BlackBerry. So I previously had no background in cybersecurity whatsoever, but after publishing, you know, whatever thousand blogs on the subject for Silence, I pretty much learned all I needed to know just by osmosis. Um, I was always fascinated by the research team's articles. So when a position opened up on the team to run their blog publishing program, I jumped to the chance. I, I love what you said about learning by osmosis. I, you know, that's that's my my motto as well. I want to be surrounded by people that are you know smarter than I than I am, or like they. That's that's not difficult, by the way. To uh, to get to to spend time with people that you know come from a different background that, that do different things. That's that's fascinating, and that's that's what I love about you know. Uh, what we do here now what would you say it's the best part of uh, your job you don't have to say the worst just like just the best <laughs> <laughs> let's start with claudia what do you think i would say personally there's just something always something new and exciting to learn about um you always have to be one step ahead of the threat actors and the field is changing every day every month um so it's a really a lot of fun when you do find something worthwhile or just something fun to take apart and really get to understand so like like solving puzzles right investigating yes. <laughs> that's awesome that's exactly what a throw researcher does and how about you natasha um just working with a bunch of extremely smart creative people who teach me something new every single day um i've been doing this for almost a decade now and i can't say i've ever been bored <laughs> That's good. We don't want to. We don't want to be bored. We don't want to be bored. Now, uh, is there anything else you want to share about yourselves? Anything that you want the audience to know about what working in a threat research team looks like? I can tell you. Okay, I can. I will. I will <laughs> tell you what I. What actually motivated me to work with this with this team, right? And um, obviously, what what we do here is really really awesome. Um, you know, we have more comments here on the on the on the LinkedIn. I appreciate that. But I think that um, having the opportunity to work uh, not only from a technology perspective, right, not only with endpoints, uh, but also with IoT, automotive, uh, the mission that BlackBerry has, right, to secure uh, uh, right now to over two hundred million cars running our uh, QNX uh, software, right? And the possibility to secure like billions of devices that are interconnected uh, in the world. That's, that's, that's amazing. And more importantly, like the mission of protecting the lives of those uh, uh, using it, right? As, as we get more things connected, um, we, we have a responsibility to, to, to protect, uh, you know, the, the people using these devices from all the threats that we, that we see. So, Anything else that you want your viewers to know about yourselves and might not know? Come on, like I don't believe that you guys are just, you know, analyzing malware all day long. Claudia, uh, <laughs> what else? What else have you done that we would be like, whoa, I didn't know. I didn't know this for you. Um, well, I won't say that I do spend all my time just analyzing malware. I do try to balance my life out a little. Um, but I would say something that is probably people wouldn't really know about me is that I did spend a few years uh, living and studying in Shanghai, in China, mm -hmm. uh, before the pandemic. Um, and so I do know a little bit of Mandarin. Um, I wouldn't say I'm anywhere near fluent though, but um, that's the third language I can kind of add under my belt. So, wow. Yeah. Well, you know <laughs> more Mandarin than I know for sure. So that's amazing. <laughs> if I have any questions, uh, I know who to go to. Natasha, how about you? Oh boy! Something okay. that will just, you know, explore well, our minds. Okay, I was uh, originally a horror novel writer before I moved to the tech world. Um, I studied film production in university, and after I got my degree, my first job was turning horror movies into books. 
So I worked on several movie franchises for New Line Cinema and uh, Rebellion Publishing, including uh, Blade, Final Destination, and uh, A Nightmare on Elm Street. And after that, I published my own trilogy of dark fantasy urban novels called uh, Dante's Girl. Most recently, um, I was an editor for the BlackBerry Research and Intelligence Team's latest book, Finally Beacons in the Dark, a, threat, a Guide to Cyber Threat Intelligence, which I have a copy here, you can see it. Pretty, yeah, pretty close to it. There you go. Now I can see it. Now I can see it. You establish my face so you can see it. There we go. <laughs> so uh, you can download a free digital copy of that by going to the BlackBerry website at blackberry.com slash beacon. Wow. I don't know what to say. So you worked on Blade, right? Nightmare on Elm Street and Finding Beacons <laughs> in the Dark, a guide to cyber threat. I don't know what the connection is between them. I'm sure it's there somewhere. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, um, I think that answers the question that we have from one of one of the users. How does how do we uniquely approach hunting the adversary? Well, that's that's actually described in the book, right? Yep. The art of anticipating the adversary by uh, hunting proactively for these uh, what we call the weapons, right? And um, uh, if you have any other questions, you know, we'll be happy to take take those. I think we're coming to the uh, towards the end of this this uh, session. Uh, what can I say? I I love uh, the fact that you guys came to the show to talk about Monster, to talk also about your personal journey. I think we, I don't know how you guys feel, but I think we should do this, right? With everybody that we bring to these LinkedIn Lives, asking them a little bit about you know how they became a threat researcher. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, I was going to ask you, Ismail, as well, um, can you tell us one thing about yourself that people might be surprised to know? Oh, me? <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so even though I've been doing this for over 22 years, and, and I love it, right? I think you can, everybody can tell that this is our passion in general because we love to talk about this. But there are many times when I just, you know, want to do something completely different and uh, to keep us sane. Um, so, for example, I, I love to do volunteering with my, with my family, right? Especially, um, you know, during the weeks when we can, but most likely... Uh, over the weekends, we uh, we try to volunteer in the community and you know help other people. That that's that's something that um, again it's related to our mission, right? What we do here in, in in BlackBerry, but it's not all about cyber. There's there's other things too, and and I love to play the guitar when I have time. Let me just see. I have something here, <laughs> right? But uh, but no, don't worry. I'm not gonna play anything. I'm not gonna sing anything either. <laughs> I want people to to get uh, to start the weekend. Um, with a good mood, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we just you know, it's not all about cyber. We we need to also keep some some balance and some sanity. That's important. All right. Well, if we don't have any other questions or comments, uh, we're going to wrap up here. Thank you so much again, uh, Natasha and Claudia, for joining us. Looking forward to having you back with uh, with us in this uh, show. And looking forward to the next uh, session in a couple of weeks where we'll continue to talk about threats, countermeasures, threat actors, and how we can defend against, uh, against these uh, attacks. All right. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the day, the rest of the weekend. Bye.